I have something to show you. I like to do that. I like to start out with pictures, get your thoughts rolling on uh, what we're to discuss tonight. It might be shocking to some people. To some people, you might be like, what are you doing, Dale? What I have to show you is this, 1955 Chevrolet Bel Air. Four door. <laughs> Four door. I fancy myself to be uh, somewhat of a car person. Uh, not not as much as, as some of you are, know a great deal more than I do, but... Uh, I like the big three, the 55, the 56, the 57, the 49, 50, 51 Mercury. Those are also favorites of mine. But for many of us, we were to drive by this, we would see its potential. We would see what it could become. And what it could become is this right here. Much, much nicer. Just like the original, all the way down to the wheels. Bumper's the same, the Bel Air insignia, you couldn't see it on the other one, it was a bit, uh, bit dark, uh, but the hood ornament was also the same, so indeed, a beautiful car. One that with the right craftsmanship, you know, can really be something beautiful, a 1955 Chevrolet. Well, let's back it up a little bit. What if this is a Christian? What if this is someone who devoted their life to Christ at one time, and for one reason or another, they got four flat tires, rusted almost through to the frame, got the dent in the rear passenger side there on the, on the rear. It's pretty rough. It's pretty rough. It's in need of restoration. It's in need of some work. At one time, it was a fantastic car. Rolling off the assembly line, might have even been restored at some other time. But the elements, the world, got back to it. And instead of looking like this, it looks like that. Tonight our lesson is entitled, The Ministry of Restoring. And what that exactly means for us as a congregation, and, and how we should operate as we consider those who need to be restored, to their faith, that might be you. That might be you here tonight. At the end of my lesson, I will make the gospel call for the invitation. I'll pronounce it at the end, and I will ask for any of those who have not been baptized, who have not become a Christian, to come forward, sit down here, and we'll baptize you. But then I'll also make a, a second plea for those who are Christians for those who have given their lives to God through baptism, devoted their lives to Christ. But because of sin, they got that rust on them. Because of their lives, they slipped back into a pattern of living that pulled them away from Christ. And they are in need of restoring. They need to be brought back to their faith, renew their first love. Because you're here, that's, that's a good thing, right? It's an awesome thing here tonight, Wednesday, Sunday, you know, you're here every time the doors are open, but we, many of us, most of us, only see you here. We only see you here. What are you doing at home? What are you doing when no one except God and your Savior are watching? What are you doing in those moments? What are you doing at work where lots of people do see you? Of course, if you're not a Christian, you need to come forward and become one tonight. But if you are a Christian and in need of restoring, come forward at the end or see me afterwards. You know, we can talk privately. If it needs to be made public, we can do that. A public sin needs to, in one way or another, be confessed of publicly so that people know that you are sorry and that you are repentant of whatever it was that you have done. This is how we believe that the gospel teaches that someone is restored back to their first love. Restore means to reestablish, to reinstate, to bring back, to revive, to heal, to mend. When mechanics work on vehicles, such as the one that I showed you, a lot of times it's brought back better than the way it was originally. There are national car titles where it's a national winner and they will take pictures of the inside of the car where on the assembly line they wrote numbers on it and they'll actually restore that back to its original state. When they restore the car, they'll have a two maybe on the engine block. And when the person restores it, they'll write a two in the same colored paint because it wants to be brought back 
to the original way that it was, and in some ways, even better. So we want to restore anyone here tonight and understand what that means as well. Matthew 4 says this, Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And Jesus called them. The Greek word translated mending can also be translated restoring. In other words, James and John by the sea were restoring their nets, making them to where they could be useful again. And we want to understand that. We want to be able to understand what that means for those who fall away from Christ and who while they were were faithful at one time, no longer are for whatever reason. We want those to be restored. The mission of the Lord was to restore man in the image of God, to reinstate him in divine favor. When Adam and Eve first ate of the fruit, God saw, he's not always going to listen to me. He's going to want to do what he wants to do. I need to send a Savior for them. And so Jesus came and died for us so that we could be brought back into good favor with God. This purpose is shown by the miracles of Jesus. For there were those who did not have their sight. And Jesus restored them. we we'll read of that in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus also restored the hearing to the deaf. We'll read this in Mark 7. Jesus also granted once again speech to those who could not speak. Also done in the same miracle actually in Mark chapter 7. And the good friends who brought their friend to the roof of, where, of the home of where Jesus was speaking. They dug a hole in the roof, lowered him down, and Jesus allowed this man, healed this man, and restored him so that he could walk once again. The same purpose here is seen in the miracles that Jesus, or in the parables rather, that Jesus often uttered. He would restore the lost coin to the woman. These come from Luke chapter 15. And as Jesus is trying to convey what it means to restore lost items to their original owner, Jesus wants the lost to come back to Him. The wandering sheep, He would have that restored to the good shepherd as well. And the prodigal son back to his father in Luke chapter 15. Many people are very close to God and and want that relationship, but something happens, some some fleshly, uh, lustful desire comes into their lives and they, and they say, I don't, I don't need God anymore, and they start going down the wrong path. Well, Jesus, in His forgiveness, in the wisdom of God, offers this restoration principle where if you do fall away, if you do start living for yourself rather than for God, you can be restored. The disciples of the Lord, us, we here this evening, are to lend ourselves to the same worthy work that God, that the Lord busied Himself about with when He was on this earth. His mission is our mission. His task is our task. We are not to bruise or to break or to crush, but to heal, to revive, to mend, to restore life to the fallen brother, thus fitting him, restoring him again for service in the kingdom. Not by our own power, but by the power of God, through His wisdom, we can address a brother or a sister in Christ who has fallen away and help to restore them, help to bring them back, because they need, indeed, that encouragement. There are many who need to be restored. And let's look at three quick categories of those, those who are to be restored. First off, a dislocated member of Christ's body. Let's turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. I read this passage this morning in my lesson. There's a little bit more of the passage that I'd like to read to get a little bit more out of it to address this particular lost brother or sister. So we become part of the body of Christ when we're baptized. And I've never had a dislocated part of my body, but I hear it's painful, especially getting it back. It's even more painful than actually getting it knocked out of joint. But I think the illustration proves well there might be someone who is simply dislocated out of where they once were. Ephesians chapter 4 In verse 16, for from the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body 
for the building up of itself in love. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind. So here, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and telling them you are a part of Christ's body. Don't walk like the Gentiles did. Don't walk, perhaps, like you once did. But you've got to be a new creature. You've got to be a new person now. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding. See, we are brought to the light when we follow Jesus Christ. We are brought to that light. There are many people who are in darkness. And even someone who who might come to Christ and be baptized, they can get back on an old path. They can get back on a a path that they tried to leave long ago, but you know we're human and we continue to make mistakes, and they went back to that old path. Paul is telling them there were people who were darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So there were people who, who left God, who left Christ, who didn't want to hear what the Holy Spirit through the inspired Word of God these days, tells them to do. And so, they start living their own life. They start living a darkened life once again. This person must be restored. Also, a transgressor. His trespass is not imaginary. It's not something that is made up at all. But it's quite clear and evident. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6. We'll be going back and forth from this to this passage. This is... Uh, our primary passage for the evening, Galatians chapter 6. Let's see what verse 1 has to say. Galatians 6. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Even if anyone is caught in a trespass. Your King James Version We'll say if anyone is overtaken in a trespass, if they are overtaken in sin, then you must go to that person and restore that person. Help them to realize the wrong that is in their life. They're, they're caught up in it. Okay? They're not simply someone who has you know, started you know, maybe doing something else on Sunday morning, but they are a transgressor. There is a sin that is overtaken in their life and now they're, they're living for something else. They're living for someone else. They're living for Satan now. And so they need to be restored. And lastly, a burdened brother or sister. A burdened brother or sister needs to be restored. And this often describes the results of a person's trespass. This person has sinned. He bears the burden of shame, perhaps, of remorse, of a guilty conscience. And if not removed, the weight of this will oftentimes crush him, will oftentimes crush her. So the one who needs to be restored has a burden. And so let's say that they, you know, at the first level that I mentioned, they just kind of become dislocated. They lose their way, they stop coming to services. But then they have more transgressions in their life. They're they're overtaken, like what Galatians says, well now... We've got someone who who needs to come back for sure, but now also we have a burdened brother or sister in Christ because not only do they have the guilt of the sin that they have done, now they have a guilt of, how do I show my face there again? How do I I go forward? What, What can I do? And I know many of you, I myself, have reached out to brothers and sisters that are in this state. It's easy to ignore phone call. It's easy to ignore a text message. It's easy to change the subject if you talk to them face to face. These are the ones who need to be restored. And if they have a burden, we need to look at Galatians 6 and verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Those who need to be restored know they need to come back. And sometimes that path needs to be made a little easier. Sometimes that burden needs to be made a little lighter. And the only way they can do that is if we, as as loving brothers and sisters, reach out to those who are caught in a trespass, who are overtaken by sin, who have been dislocated, who, who have this burden 
they just can't carry well enough to walk through our doors. So what we must do is reach out to these so to help them with that burden so that they might return and be restored. Next, what is the instrument of restoring? What is used exactly to restore people? Well, us caring Christians are the brethren, members of the same family, children of the same father. We are the ones who must reach out to those who are lost, who are erring, who are in need of restoration. Well, how can I do that? Dale, that's a good question. That's a tough one. When people come to me to talk, they oftentimes want to come to me. They want to come. They want to go to a counselor. They make that decision. Something's wrong in my life. I've got to do something about it. It's a, different, it's a different world when you know you've got to go to that person and they know they need to be gone too. That's a completely different dynamic. But it is something that we must consider and pray about. Maybe if you're having difficulty addressing something with someone, some life that they're in, perhaps you've not prayed about it. Can you pray more? Can you ask others to pray for those people? Genesis chapter 4, one of the earliest passages in the history of mankind, of course. But it lays the ground for what would become... You know, even something that's pertinent, even today. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Spiritually, at least. Yes, indeed, we are. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. We're not fully responsible for their decisions. We're not fully responsible for the sin in their life. You know, we don't have to answer for that. What we do have to answer for is, have we reached out? to these people because it is spiritually minded brethren, the stronger ones, that must reach out to those who are struggling. Let's look at Romans chapter 15, please. Romans chapter 15. People will fall away for a variety of reasons and they'll tell you, yeah, I know I need to get back in church. Yeah, I know I need to get my life right. You know, and they've just started going downhill and man, it's easier to go downhill it's easier to go down these stairs than it is to come up them especially after a good meal but it's easier to go downhill than it is to stop and to come back up but for those of us who are spiritually minded we need to be reminded of what it is we need to be about because we are the instruments of restoring just as Jesus told his disciples told us to go and and preach the gospel. You know, that's, that's to the new people. That's to those who had not heard it yet. But there's a group that has heard it. There's a group that has committed themselves. There's a group that has let the world get inside their heart. There is a, a group that has allowed the world to harden their heart. And they become callous. And they go back to the dark. And their saltiness has, has been lost. And they go back to their old ways of life. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Remember what I said this morning about how to kill a church, right? Think only of yourself and not of anyone else. Well, this speaks against that, of course, as well. We should not be thinking of ourselves. We should be thinking about those who are weaker than us. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please Himself. The King of kings and Lord of lords did not please Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on Me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ. How can we be of the same mind if we're separated? Verse 6, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the point of restoring so that we can be back together, so that the body can be strengthened, so that edification can occur, so that when judgment day happens we can look at each other and be glad that we're there 
And we can look around and see those brothers and sisters who had a tough time. And you can feel good about yourself that perhaps you had something to do with that person being restored, with that person coming to Christ at all. But for tonight, with something to do with that person being restored back to their first love. Because it is those who are spiritually minded, those who are strong, that must be about this. The carnal cannot restore the carnal. The weak cannot strengthen the weak. The fallen cannot lift the fallen. It must be those who are in a position, spiritually speaking, that God can work through those people. Whenever you use the Word of God to reach those you are concerned about, you can be His instrument of restoring. And then finally, the method of restoring. How should we go about it? What are some of those specific things that we can do? And a lot of it has to do with your disposition, with the position of your heart. What is your attitude toward the fall? It's easy enough to look down on someone who has fallen away with contempt, with a judgmental attitude, but what we must do is look at them with sympathy. And if you've ever been in their shoes before, you'll, you'll go even beyond sympathy and you'll have an empathic heart because perhaps you've overcome those same sins, you've overcome those same bad habits, those same demons, and you, you look at a younger person or, or even an old friend and, and you think, man, I've been there. And you can really look at that person with a sympathetic heart, with a loving heart. It really helps out in that, in that vein because you can look at them and say, and I know why you're going down that path. And you're probably the best one to talk to them about that. People in alcohol in drug recovery, they'll hardly ever uh, listen to someone who's not dealt with those same uh, addiction cycles. And so it's very difficult if you're not a former addict to counsel someone uh, through an addiction because the person going through it will look at you and say, I, I, I don't know how you're not addicted to it. You know, and we might look at people in, in a certain sin or dealing with something uh, along the alcohol and drug avenue and think, how can you do that? And they'll look at you and think, how can you not? And so it is with sympathy that we must look at all of mankind, but particularly those that we might be quick to have a judgmental eye. So hopefully you can understand how someone falls away because they get caught, because they get overtaken in a sin. But in either case, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says that we should restore them in the spirit of gentleness. If you've been sick for any period of time and been in the hospital, you know what I mean when I say uh, bedside manners. What is a doctor, what is a nurse's bedside manner like? Because that makes a tremendous difference. And so with a physician that is patient, that knows infinitely more than you do, or now or I do, about our, what's wrong with us physically, for them to sit there day after day, hour after hour, and answer every question that they've heard hundreds and hundreds of times. I'll sit in awe at a physician like that. But one who is quick, who's ready to get out, who is you know, very, very speedy with their evaluation, not listening to you, you're not going to go back. You're not going to go back to that person. Because they treated you in such a way that they didn't listen to you. They had no sympathy. If anything, they had contempt with you and you're like, I'm not going back to that person. You see, they didn't have the spirit of gentleness when they were trying to help you, when you wanted them rather, to help you with your physical ailment. They did not have good bedside manners. Spiritually speaking, it's much the same. It's much the same. We've got to have that good manner that spirit of gentleness when we approach someone in need of restoration. We've got to be careful, though, because self-righteousness in this predicament is not allowed. In other words, you can't think, well, look how healthy I am. Here's all the great ways I overcame 
your temptation. Maybe that can be presented somehow as a form of encouragement. But lauding your accomplishments is not the way to go whenever it comes to this moment. Galatians 6 and verse 1 warns us, you know, look to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Because in whatever the situation might be, you might be tempted by whatever that person is being drawn away from and suddenly the influence is going the wrong way. You went to try to help them be restored back to Jesus, but instead they they pulled you uh, out of the boat and into the water with them. And Paul warns against that whenever he wrote to the church at Galatia. Be careful that you're not tempted as well. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, then he deceives himself. Maybe you did overcome that temptation. Maybe you can't understand why it is that the person has fallen the way they have. But in any case, we must learn from those who have fallen before us, so that we don't fall into that same trap. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. We can definitely learn from those who have fallen away. So be ready though, be prepared that you not be pulled into their sinful life. It's one of the things that many people would warn you against. You know, if you want to reach someone, reach them with the gospel, but don't Go to them, and then the, the tables be reversed. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Your heading above, above verse 1 probably says something like, Hey, avoid Israel's mistakes. Verse 7, Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble if some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation is overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So we must look at what the Israelites went through, and how they faltered, and how they fell. And you'll see those in your life who have faltered, who have fallen, who have gotten away from Christ. And you need to reach out to them, but you also must be careful. There's temptations that we'll face, and God's going to provide a way out of that. But you've got to be willing and able to to reach for that life preserver, to reach for His lifeline so that He can pull you away from that when, when the time is appropriate. Be careful when trying to be this method of restoring that you not get self-righteous, that you not pump yourself up. Hey, look what I'm doing and then things get turned around, and you get pulled down with the sinner, but rather help to pull them away from the sin that has overtaken them. By restoring your brother, you help to bear his burdens. And when you bear his burden, you fulfill the law of Christ, as Galatians 6 told us, and this being the law of love. The great work of Christ was and is to mend broken lives. When we give ourselves to the same noble work as we're supposed to do, we become fellow workers of Christ and partakers of His likeness. Are you doing what Christ would have you to do as a Christian? Perhaps you need to work on helping people come back to Christ. Perhaps you yourself need to come back to Christ and be restored tonight. Talk to me, come forward during the invitation song or see me afterwards. Or maybe you need to start your Christian life and become a Christian. And I hope you'll do that this evening if you are not. If you have any of these needs, please come forward now as we stand and sing. I am resolved no longer.